pediatric speech language pathologist and welcome to Teach Me to Talk the podcast. I'm so excited about today's show because we are beginning a brand new podcast series that'll last about 12 shows that I'm calling the Autism Series. And we're going to start this first show with what is probably the most difficult part for we as early intervention professionals, speech language pathologists and other therapists who are talking to parents about autism. And this is hard for us because I think we don't have enough training in this. And lots of us have degrees that were conferred in the previous century when we didn't even learn about autism in school. So again, this has been a pretty steep learning curve for lots of us. And even if you're a younger therapist, or especially if you're a parent joining us for this show, I want to talk about how autism is diagnosed a little bit, but mostly I want to talk about how we explain that to parents. And so if you purchase the CE credit for this show, which uh, you're watching us now on YouTube, but you can go to my website at teachmetotalk.com and click on um, the link that I provided there and you'll go straight to uh, the show Uh, post for this podcast and you will get the handout for this and on the handout you will find information that I have modified from the DSM-5 which is the gold standard in um, diagnosing autism as well and I used another tool you can see the references here on the bottom but I've created this one page handout and this is what I use when I talk with parents about autism because I think it's so helpful for us to have a tool and that we can be confident that we're just not pulling things out of thin air when we're explaining it. This is research-based. It's uh, certainly um, official. So I like this tool. So even if you don't plan on using the show for CE credit, you may want to go ahead and get the handout because I'm talking directly from this today. And it really, uh, in a one-page description, takes all of that pretty complicated information and, and puts it in chunks so that you can explain this to parents and again I think this makes us more white knuckled than anything as therapists when we're talking to parents about autism sometimes parents expect it and are bringing up that diagnosis to you and sometimes this is completely out of the blue for them this may be a fear that they have have not even really admitted to themselves and so I think using a tool can really help you get this conversation started or I'll tell you For me, most of those conversations happen pretty, um, not casually, but we don't spend a lot of time talking about it. A parent may ask me about it, or we may begin those conversations, but this is what I use when we're really, really serious about it, when I'm making a referral so that a child can get a team assessment, which is best practice in diagnosing autism, or when a parent says to me, do you think he has autism? Do you think this is autism? And a lot of times I'll say yes, but let, or I think so. Let's look at this list together and let's talk about this together so that you are prepared and that you understand what is autism and what is not and what it takes to officially get this diagnosis. And so let's just walk this uh, through this together. So let's start out with, with what I always talk about first, just autism affects a lot of things in a child. It affects how he interacts with other people, it affects how he communicates, and it certainly affects how he behaves. And so when we think about those three criteria, interaction, communication, and behavior, we can really put every little diagnostic characteristic that we're going to talk talk about today in one of those three big topics and or three big categories. And so when a parent is kind of getting, let's say, um, distracted a little bit from this is autism or, or this is not autism is how it usually happens, I try to steer it back to how a kid interacts, how he communicates, and how he behaves. Because that triad is what really, really um, uh, 
creates or or this is what we when we see this triad in children this this these problems with interacting problems with communicating and, and differences in how they behave as compared to same age peers this is what autism is so it's how we explain autism to parents so if that's not something that you're used to saying as a therapist I would really really encourage you to adapt that language and think about autism affects how a kid interacts how he communicates and how he behaves and one other thing that I always like to tell parents is and this is straight from the DSM-5 is that these symptoms are always present in early childhood. So that's another marker for how we, we know that this is autism and that these difficulties aren't due to something like a global developmental delay, meaning that a, a kid is just across the board in all five developmental domains, you know, physical, cognitive, you know, his motor skills under physical, you know, cognitive, how he thinks, how he learns, how he remembers, how he plans, his communication skills, his self-help skills, and his social emotional skills so when we're looking at all of those all of those domains we're not saying hey there are problems across the board we're saying that there are problems in these three specific areas how he interacts how he communicates and again how he behaves and these difficulties that he's experiencing aren't due to just kind of a global developmental delay that doesn't really explain what's going on uh, and it's not due to just intellectual and impairment. Now we don't call this mental retardation like we used to. Uh, it's not as politically correct anymore and so a lot of times if I can see a parent going there I'll say this it, this isn't due to intellectual impairment. Let me also say this about 30 percent of children who have autism do have intellectual impairments and do have cognitive differences or delays compared to their uh, other little children who are their same age, but at the same time, that's not all that's going on. So you want to be careful about saying that too. But let's just walk through this together. And so usually I tell therapists, especially if you're listening, if you're listening to the podcast, I usually tell a therapist, go ahead and just listen to the show and get the handout later and that'll kind of pull it all together for you. But for this piece of information, you actually might want to watch this on YouTube so that you can go ahead and get the handout first and download it and look at it as we're going through this and make some notes so that the next time you have to use this information, you are ready and you have done your homework. So let's just get started. The first big thing that we want to talk about when we look at the diagnostic criteria for autism from the DSM-5 is the, there are two big categories, social communication difficulties and restricted interest and behaviors. And so those first two things that we talked about, interacting and communicating, actually fall over here with social communication difficulties. And in order for a child to receive a diagnosis of autism, he has to have problems in all three of these areas that we've highlighted here on the handout. The first one is problems initiating and responding to others. So that would be the interaction piece. Now let me just say, for those of us who are speech language pathologists, we don't see a child unless there's a communication problem and unless there's, usually unless the child is not talking. And sometimes parents will be really on the ball and you'll get a referral. I've had several referrals for children who are two and a half approaching that three-year-old mark or even older than three and a parent says he talks but <laughs> she knows words but and so you might be surprised if you're going through this diagnostic criteria for the first time to not see speech delay or language delay listed in black and white here that's because all kids with autism don't have a language delay at the beginning now it is a marker it is common but you know sometimes there are children with autism who do talk who do begin to acquire a lot of words or they may be highly echolalic so that they imitate really really well they don't just imitate single words they can imitate paragraphs so again you may be surprised as an SLP or a teacher if you are uh, listening or watching and and you start looking at this information you say where where's speech delay where's language delay it's not really on here because the problem with autism is not that some kids don't talk and the most recent studies say 20 to 30 percent of children with autism will remain nonverbal throughout their lives and again that's kids who get an early intervention have a much better shot of overcoming that but speech language delay in in, in and of itself is not listed on the criteria it just says that these symptoms are 
present in early childhood and then we we look at all these problems that result with how children use their words and many many times children with autism who are verbal pretty early so they're learning learning some words at one and at two the problem isn't that they don't know how to talk the problem is that they don't know how to use their words and so again that may be a surprise for you if you are uh, really looking at this information for the for the very first time officially that you're not going to see speech language delay in black and white as as one of the criteria although we know that that's a big problem so social communication uh, Difficulties includes problems initiating and responding to others, problems with nonverbal communication, and then problems with social awareness and building relationships. So let's take those three areas and really dive in right now so that you'll know how to explain this to parents. So the first one here is problems initiating and responding to others. So I'll, t I'll tell you one other thing that I do when I'm using this tool with parents is that we'll talk about these things and, and, and I'll, sh I'll show you this as we go through it. As I say something like limited sharing, warm, joyful expressions or flat, reduced affect, which is our first bullet point under problems initiating and responding. When I read something like that, if a child has a really specific example, I'll say, like, remember last time when I saw you and, and so we're going to give really specific um, examples here so that a parent can really, really understand that you are not just pulling this diagnosis or this potential diagnosis out of thin air, you've got some clinical examples. You've got, you've got some evidence here that lets you know that, gosh, this is a likely uh, diagnosis or this is a likely, I like to say, explanation <laughs> for what's going on with a child. It really explains why he's having so much difficulty interacting and difficulty communicating and why his behavior seems so different from what we would expect uh, another two-year-old or three-year-old or four-year-old uh, to behave like. And so, and, and behavior, I don't necessarily mean good behavior or bad behavior. I'm just looking at what a child does, his actions. And again, we'll talk about that. But if you can keep this in your discussions with parents, pretty specific to what a child does, that'll give you some credibility. And again, what you want to do with this is help a parent begin to move toward acceptance. Some parents will feel relief when you first start talking about this because they say, you know, at least there's an explanation. I am not crazy. <laughs> there is something going on with this child. People haven't listened to me. They've dismissed my fears. And yes, they may still be upset and afraid and all those other very natural emotional responses that we feel as parents who love our children you know, to the ends of the earth and back. But at the same time, some parents do feel a sense of relief saying, well, I knew it. I knew something was really, really wrong. I knew this wasn't just a speech delay. I've been telling my mom forever he was different. And so you'll, you'll hear that with some parents, but more often than not, parents are so scared that they are going to be defensive when you start talking about some of this with them. And again, I'm not talking about if you work in a diagnostic treatment or a diagnostic center where you are routinely, where parents are bringing children in specifically for the reason of being diagnosed. They expect to hear yes or no and that kind of thing. I'm talking about for those of us who work with families week after week after week after week. And we're the frontline providers. We're the people who have built relationships with uh, entire families sometimes and so when we're talking to moms and dads about this it it really uh, almost not almost it does pull at our heartstrings and tug at our heartstrings too because we've come to know that and love this child too and know and love these parents and we know that for some of these families that we're giving this information to are starting this process you know this is very very hurtful even if they've suspected it even if they know it and so sometimes in that hurt they get really really defensive and so if you can make these examples as specific as possible without being accusatory or uh, without kind of trying to prove your point. And I think sometimes we get so caught up in that, especially as younger therapists. Uh, and I, I certainly know, I don't, I don't want to put all of you in the same box as me, but I know when I was younger, sometimes I really got caught up in really, you know, wanting a parent to understand that it was autism. And, and especially if I were, if I was the only person who, who thought a child was on the spectrum and other team members were leaning a different way but I, I knew it in my heart and so I would kind of 
kind of push the point beyond where people were comfortable. And I'll just tell you, I learned not to do that. <laughs> I don't want to build, uh, burn bridges with people. I want to build bridges. And so I want to continue to build that relationship, even if I'm giving them really terrible information. And so we want to be as specific as possible when we are going through these examples. So let's get back to this. The first social communication difficulty, problems initiating and responding to others. And so when you're going through this bullet list, you know, you can start with a conversation like initiating means how he goes out of his way to communicate and let you know that something is going on or that he needs you or that he needs your assistance to do something or he just wants to hang out with you. How you know kids with autism have problems doing this this is why a lot of times they look like little loners they would prefer to play by themselves or give them an ipad and they don't care what else is going on around them they they don't really initiate a lot if they may or if they have uh, let's say a toy breaks in their bedroom and they may cry, they may throw the toy, they may abandon it and move on to do something else. But a lot of times kids with autism, one of the characteristics is they don't know how to take that toy to a parent. They don't know how to scream, mama, mama, so that mom can come in and help them uh, get through uh, whatever problem it is that they need to solve. And so this is what we're talking about, problems initiating and responding to others. And so on the other end of that is responding finding the one of the the biggest diagnostic characteristics with a toddler uh, for a child who will go on to be diagnosed with autism is that he does not respond to his own name. And so a lot of times parents will think, is this hearing loss? Is this that he's being stubborn? <laughs> is this that he just won't listen? He just wants to do his own thing? And again, this is what this is what makes autism different from those other kinds of things. There, There is not a hearing loss. It is not that the child is being uh, willfully disobedient. He just, he has autism. He, this is one of the ways that he's affected with that. So problems initiating and responding to others. So let's look at these bullet points. And again, I hope that you've gotten your handout so that you can listen but and, and follow along. But if not, no big deal. You'll go back and get it later. So number one, limited sharing, warm, joyful expressions, or flat, reduced affect. So let's talk about this. Autism is a spectrum disorder, which means that not there, there are different ranges and degrees, and not every child with autism is going to look exactly like another child with autism. And that's what throws kind of a lot of parents. For parents, when they kind of get in that bargaining, you know, the stages of grief, and they, they get to the bargaining phase, and they're saying, he can't have autism because he does this, or he can't have autism because I know a kid down the street with autism, and he doesn't do this at all. He does this. This. And so again, you'll see some parents that'll do that kind of thing. And that's just a normal part of processing what's going on. And so you'll be able to talk about autism as a spectrum disorder. And some of these things the child might have severe difficulties with, but be milder in another area. And we'll talk about the severity levels too. You know, and just like everything else, uh, there's kind of a mild, moderate, severe rating. But of course, we don't really use that terminology. And, and you know, we call it different levels. And we'll, we'll talk about that when we get there. But that's something that you can really talk about with parents because sometimes you might say if you read this limited sharing warm joyful expressions or a flat reduced affect and a parent might say what are you talking about he smiles at me uh, what are you talking about? But he, he, he doesn't do that. So he, I, I see him look joyful every time I throw him up in the air and we uh, play a specific game. And so you'll really, really have to talk about that with parents. And again, I encourage you not to get so caught up in the, he does, he doesn't. You know, you're just going to want to give this information and give as many examples as you can without um, being argumentative or defensive yourself. So you want to talk about that um, sometimes it kind of takes a kid a while to, before he starts smiling or before he really uh, shows you that joy, that warm, joyful expression. Uh, a lot of times you'll want the flat, reduced affect. I'll say that to parents a lot. Sometimes a parent will characterize a child as very serious or very, um, very, I had one parent that would talk about all the time how she really, really thought her child was really going to be, um, 
you know, really into reading because, you know, she felt like that he only, res you know, he only wanted to do books. And, I, you know, you have to talk about, you know, other than that, that flat, reduced affect, that, that's not really what we see with children. That's not what, if you look at a child versus, you know, a child with autism or suspected autism versus lots of other children, you'll see a difference there in how quickly they um, respond to other people and how quickly or how easily it is to engage them. You don't really have to work. You don't have to really get in there and, you know, break out a sweat and do all your performing and all your tricks and all your games to get a child engaged with you. And again, this is a mark of, of, of characteristic, a symptom of autism when they have have that difficulty and you have to work so hard uh, to get their attention and to keep them with you. Another thing that kids do that fall under this characteristic, kids with autism, is abnormal social interaction. So this would mean that they do things that you don't see other kids do. One of the biggest characteristics or examples here with this abnormal social interaction would be a child who uses another person's hand as a tool. So it would be a kid who's playing with you who can't figure out how to, um, say, open the door on a barn or a house or, a, you know, whatever kind of little toy that you're using together. And so instead of looking at you and, and, and getting your attention and asking you, can you please open this door in whatever way it might be, they, a typically developing child might say mama or help or uh, 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 and look at you and, and look back at the door and look at you until you figure out that they can't do it. A kid with autism will often take your hand and put it on the door and they kind of miss that social piece. They miss the looking at you. They miss saying what they want you to do or asking you to do something for them, making a request. That's the initiation part. They miss it, but they try to get your help anyway. They know that you're there. They want you to help them, but they think about you as just like another kind of uh, kind of a means to an end there. They take your hand and have, and have you do it. This would be kind of like leading. A lot of kids with autism, when they first, uh, and it's actually a good sign, it's actually great <laughs> that they would approach a parent and lead them, but it's kind of like the big hand thing. They don't really realize that attached to your hand that can help them is this arm and this face that they're supposed to look at and, and interact with and communicate with. They're just really using your body. So they may lead you into the kitchen and then put your hand on the refrigerator door and then when you get the door open they may push you in or reach reach your hand again to try to get you to put your hand on the juice they don't stand in point and say juice or point to the milk they may try to get it themselves if they're not using your hand but again it's that interaction piece that's missing and so that's something that we can talk with parents about as well just that they're not asking you for things they're not a approaching you for things you kind of still have to figure it out like when they were a smaller um, baby that you just heard them cry and you looked around to try to figure out what was wrong so that you can make it better for them they're still kind of doing that they haven't gone on they haven't matured to the point where they are communicating and using words and or gestures to, and facial expressions to, directed specifically to you to let you know what they're doing so again that abnormal social interaction. The third part of this is reduced sharing of interest, enjoyment, and emotions. And so a lot of times, like that example I was giving you before with that mom that would talk to me about how she uh, just knew her child was gonna be, you know, really, really, really into books or a librarian or a teacher or something like that because of the love for books. And again, I'm not, I'm not knocking that kind of assumption. I mean, my goodness, I, I did that with my own children. We all do that, that's really natural. But at the same time, if you looked at that child when uh, he was looking at books, he didn't want to share that with anybody. How he looked at a book was this. He flipped through the pages. He, he didn't really do a lot of pondering. He didn't want to listen to the story, so he didn't share that with a book reading experience with his mom. He's just right there focused on that visual bump that he's receiving from flipping those pages back and forth as quickly as he could. So that's the sharing piece of that. Kids don't do a lot of that. Sometimes we'll, with a child with autism, they will be really intensely focused on something, but when you try to join them, nothing. <laughs> Sometimes they get mad at you for wanting to play with them. Sometimes they, uh, again, look like loners 
because they are off when they're they may even be playing um, in a, a crowded situation with a lot of kids but they're just right there kind of doing their own thing and so they aren't really sharing or uh, enjoying things with other people. They're really pretty solitary. And so the fourth bullet point under this one is poor social initiation and interaction, and again, doesn't respond to name. And so we've already talked a lot about that. So uh, social communication difficulties are first one problems initiating and responding to others. And again, be sure that when you're talking with a parent, come up with specific examples that you can talk about that child. You may say, you know how it is when we wanna get his attention and we call his name and call his name and call his name and he doesn't respond, but then we go over to him that's what I'm talking about here he doesn't really respond to us or you can give an example like when she wants something what does she do does she use a word does she use a gesture what does she do there and if a mom says she's not really doing anything that's what we're talking about problems initiating and responding to others second bullet bullet point here is problems with nonverbal communication and again if you're an SLP and you're surprised that speech delay is not on there Look at this nonverbal verbal communication piece because it's going to make a lot of sense to you. We know that research says that gestures emerge before words do in typical language development. So when we have a kid who is having lots of difficulty learning to recognize and then use gestures, so a kid that you are trying to wave bye-bye to him and he just will, he, he doesn't, he doesn't pay attention to it at all. I mean, I have kids that, and I'm sure you have the same experience. You worked with them the whole session. You're getting ready to go or they're getting ready to leave where you are, your office, and you will just do everything you can to get them to wave bye-bye to you. You're in their little faces. You're taking their hands to wave. You want them just to acknowledge that you were waving and saying bye-bye. And they're just not doing that yet. That's part of nonverbal communication. They don't recognize that that wave is, uh, that you're giving them a message with that. And so that certainly is something that, um, that's, that's a marker when kids are having difficulty understanding and using gestures. So we're not only talking about things like waving, things like pointing. I gave you that example before when the kid is going to the refrigerator and he might use his mom's hand to put it on the milk or the juice to let her know which one he wants. He doesn't really stand there and point like a typically developing toddler would. That's part of this. And eye contact and eye gaze are certainly a part of difficulty with nonverbal communication. We all know how much difficulty uh, kids with autism can have with eye contact. We all know that from hearing adults with autism explain their experiences in childhood and adolescence and even on uh, into adulthood, some of them describe eye contact as painful that it's not pleasant for them, that they avoid it. And so that's certainly something that we'll see with children. And you can use that example with parents. You can say, you know how hard it is to get him to look at you when you're trying to get to talk to him? You know how, how you might say something like that, that I say is, you know, I have to get down and I have to just kind of find where his eyes are and then see if, if I can get it then. And so they'll, they'll recognize that. And instead of you just saying something like difficulty with eye contact, you want to give that really, really specific uh, example. Another thing that that's really difficult for kids uh, who are on the autism spectrum is joint attention, meaning that they, and we talked about this a little bit in the first uh, bullet point under social communication difficulties, but it really comes in here. Joint attention is not looking at what you are talking about or not sharing the same experience. And so the biggest indicator of a kid who has poor joint attention is he doesn't learn to look at what you are pointing at or what you are trying to show him. And I know that you've had this experience as a therapist. You have what you think is a cool toy or even as a parent, you want to show a kid something. And so you're right there in his face and he does everything except look at that toy. He's wiggling to get away away from you. He's turned and I mean you just kind of want to hold him down sometimes and say look at it or look at me. And again, he's it's, he's not he's not doing that because he doesn't want to do it. He's not doing it because he can't do it. And so that's a really really big um, indicator there. Other problems that we note with nonverbal communication, and, and this is a little tricky for those of us who are therapists, but these are going to be things outside of the words that a child uses, but the rate, the rhythm, the intonation, the pitch, and volume when a child does begin to talk may be different. And so you may hear a kid that sounds a little robotic or his speech might sound choppy or his speech.
Beach might sound a lot of times like his favorite character in, in his favorite movie <laughs> at the time. And so not only is he echolalic with the words that he's saying from that movie, he may also have copied the rate, the rhythm, the intonation, and the pitch of the character that he uh, is so fond of. And so again, you may hear a kid talk and just think something sounds kind of off with that. I'm not quite sure what that is. Now we know that we also see these issues with apraxia and apraxia is, uh, studies say that can be as high as 63% uh, of children with autism have apraxia. And so when you think, gosh, is, is autism the reason he's not talking or is apraxia the reason he's not talking? It's both. <laughs> and so again, we're gonna see these problems and it is part of making this diagnosis. They're not only problems with you know, how he interacts or problems with not using words. It's even this nonverbal part of communication that he's really, really struggling with. And we've already talked about this fourth bullet point under this with nonverbal communication is problems understanding his own emotions and the emotions of others. And so you may see a child with autism, especially as they start to be in childcare situations or in situations with peers or even adults that they don't know very well. Um, they are going to have difficulty, again, relating to them emotionally. And so they may see a child who is very, very upset and really not know how to process that. Or they may be so disturbed by their little brothers or sisters crying, like if, they, if mom or dad have a new baby, and they, the new baby's cries just irritate the, and annoy the child and we think that it might be an auditory sensitivity. Another problem is that they're not understanding that that's an emotional cry that a baby <laughs> needs to cry to get his parents to understand that there's something wrong. And so they don't get that. They may not understand when you are hurt. They may not understand when you are mad, when you are trying to redirect them or stop them from doing something dangerous. A typically developing child will recognize that on your part and will think, start to process even as a two-year-old I'm in trouble <laughs> and this is, I better listen. And kids with autism really, really struggle with that again because of those problems with nonverbal communication. They can't read your face. They don't always understand what's going on when you are trying to, uh, when you are emotionally communicating to them. They do not get that, not only what your words mean, but what your emotions mean too. And sometimes they have difficulty with that in themselves too. And we're gonna to talk about that when we get over in the, the next section, but with their emotional responses can sometimes be all over the place. So we'll look at that. So that was the second area. Now remember with social communication difficulties for a child to get a diagnosis of autism, he has to have problems in all three of these areas. Not necessarily all the bullet points, but the examiners have to be able to say, this is a problem with nonverbal communication. This is a problem with initiating and responding to others. All right, and the last area under social communication difficulties is problems with social awareness and building relationships. And again, this is noted more in, with people beyond immediate family members. And this is such a hard thing for parents to sometimes process because they have such, especially moms, and I'm, I'm not knocking dads out there, Johnny has been a wonderful father to his children for our oldest son has turned 31 for 31 years and he's a fantastic parent and 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 I can I have worked with the most incredible dads in the world I think God has blessed me with that in my practice um, over these last 27 however long it is years however sometimes a mom is so ultra tuned in to a child with autism because she is that child's only real connection in the world and i'm going to get a little bit emotional talking about it because i've so seen that and so with moms um, they'll sometimes get a little bit confused with this diagnostic criteria because they will say gosh, he doesn't have any of these problems with me. He makes eye contact with me. He smiles at me. He, he, sometimes he'll come get me if it's really, really bad. And so you have to say, mom, these issues or these problems are going to be more noticeable with people other than you. 
because you are his lifeline and you have devoted your whole life, all two years, or his whole life, all two years and two months and two days of his little life to interpreting the world for him, to making things better for him. And so he has learned the the give and take, the reciprocity, he is establishing that with you. But when you look at how he interacts with other people beyond you, this is what we're really, really going to measure. And so you really have to talk to parents about that. And again, I've, we are in such a unique position for this, those of us who've done early intervention and those of us who are lucky enough to have, you know, seen kids in homes and really, really gotten to know parents back before COVID was, you know, really shut everything down. And so we build these relationships with parents. And so we can see moms really, really struggle with these things. And so we have to kind of help them understand it's, it's, we're really not looking at this just with how he is with you or with you and dad or with you and dad and, you know, everybody that lives in your house, maybe grandparents or siblings. We're going to look at how he does with other people. And sometimes parents have even said, well, he's pretty good with you. He's, and I say, yeah, <laughs> because I've devoted my whole life to this and getting really, really good at getting kids who don't want to interact with me to, to like me and want to be with me. And so really talk about that with parents and, and say, yeah, but how, how does he do with his preschool teacher? How does he do with the neighbor how does he do with when you take him to the library you know if you still get to do that or did that before covid you know whatever social thing you're getting to do or is currently going on how does he do with that and so talk with talk with um parents about that under this category difficulty with peer friendships is a big deal because a lot of times kids will um do better with children who are much older and so you've really got to look at how they're doing with kids that are about the same age. So how does he do when he goes to a birthday party? Does he try to join in? How does he do when uh, you're at like a family event and there are lots of other kids there? Is he uh, in with the other kids really, really playing with this? Many, many times are, are playing with them with what they are doing and everybody's, again, that sharing back and forth. Are they doing it together? And so you'll be able to gain some insight there. A lot of times our little friends with autism are just kind of back um, just kind of right outside the crowd. Sometimes they're all the way across the room because they're not really with other people, kind of out there doing their own thing. So talk about those kinds of things. Um, sharing imaginative play is another big one. Sometimes parents will look at, well, you know, now when there's a train table, say at the pediatrician's office, and my and another kid's at the train table, my kid will play at the train table too. That's really parallel play. They're both there. They're both playing with the trains, but the child with autism or the markers for autism or red flags may not even really look at the other child. Or you, he's, if the other child tries to give him a train, he may not take it, or he may not try to share one of those toys with another child. And certainly with imaginative play, a lot of our little guys with autism don't don't get to that pretending stage without lots and lots of help. They may, you may see some things that you think, oh gosh, cognitively, he really is thinking about this and this little toy, but you really don't see a ton of evidence of that. You don't really see a lot of pretend play in a toddler. You don't see him initiate giving the baby doll a, a, a spoon of pretend food. You don't really see him pretending to cook. Now he may be in the kitchen uh, in the pretend play kitchen, messing with the spatula, holding the spatula up to the light, or pushing the button on the toy microwave over and 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 over again. And those, when we really, really look at those kinds of things, those are uh, cause and effect play that he's kind of perseverating on, or uh, he's still getting that visual stem if he's holding the spatula up to the light and looking at that. And so you really have to, again, tease that sort of thing out and talk to parents about that and start to get parents to be uh, more educated, I guess you would say, or or that that's I don't I don't mean to slam that I don't mean to say uneducated. They just become better observers. You tell them what they're looking for. Just because a kid is over in the pretend kitchen messing around with the dishes doesn't mean that he's pretending. And so talk to parents about that and help them kind of understand that. And again, a big one here: problems with social awareness and building relationships. Kids with autism often prefer objects over people. And we've already talked about the dreaded iPad. If you bring the iPad out, you might as well forget it. They're not going to do any interacting with you because they so prefer that iPad. 
uh, as, over anything that you could show them. And so, t- uh, or if they have just a prized possession, let's say that they are super attached to their very favorite uh, Thomas the Train toy, and they may not let go of that, or we'll talk about that specific behavior in a minute, but they may be so into Thomas that they don't really care about much that's going on beyond that because that's their focus and so that we can see even when you're trying to interact with them even when you're trying to show them and get them to do something that's you think is going to be more fun than that it's really really hard to pull them away from what that is all right so those were the three areas of social communication difficulties let's move on to this next section restricted interest and behaviors or restricted repetitive behaviors, and professionals refer to this as RRBs, and so that's what we're going to call them, and you might, in your lingo with parents, explain it, explain it, explain it, and then get them used to hearing that terminology if they are getting that diagnosis, and if stems are a big part, uh, to get them to call it what a professional would call it will certainly um, may help a parent as they Uh, start to see a lot of professionals or if they choose to do that and and understand that professional terminology. So restricted interest in behaviors. And again, there are four sections. If you look at your handout um, under this uh, big category here and a child to get an official diagnosis of autism needs to have two of these. So the first one is repetitive speech movements or object use. So if you are a therapist, here are your stems, your self-stimulatory behaviors and your three areas, again, speech, movements, and object use. And you just need to learn this (laughs) so that you can recognize this. So when you see this, you think, ah, that's a stem. Need to be, that's a red flag for autism here. I need to, I need to look at this. I need to ex- explore this a little more. And so what is repetitive speech? Well, this could be echolalia. So a child is lifting sections of a previous dialogue that he's heard. It could be, it's usually something like a movie or a TV show. A kid might memorize an entire book. And how do you know, I mean, as a therapist, as a speech therapist, you're thinking, how is that bad? <laughs> It's not in that a kid who can say a whole book knows how to talk, but does he understand it? Is he processing it? Is he using those words meaningfully? And again, remember that interacting piece is so difficult for kids with autism. So even if they are spouting off, you know, what Jasmine, Jasmine's whole soliloquy there or their favorite Disney princess in a movie, um, that's echolalia. And so that's, that's what you talk to about with parents. A lot of times parents will say she's pretending ending and and unless there are activities to go along with that and unless, you know it's really really echolalia so you have to talk with parents about that jargon jargon would be unintelligible phrase length utterances and I am terrible at modeling jargon for you so I'm not even going to try but it's when a kid does his whole gobbledygook whatever he's saying his his uh whole string of sounds that you can't really make out that's jargon and again jargon is a part of typical language development kids usually do it right at about that 18 month level or maybe even before then when they have single words and they know that they're supposed to talk in sentences because everybody around them talks to them in sentences, but they don't have the vocabulary yet to to put all of those real words together. So they're doing a lot of jargon. So again, that is uh, a a lot of times all of these things. Well, Well, some of these things. In autism, it's just that the child really is stuck at an earlier developmental level. And so a kid who uses jargon at three or at four, you know, that, that might be something here that, that would be a red flag. It is, but it is a step toward typical language development too. So don't kind of hold both those, both those opposite thoughts. Hold them because they're both true. All right, rote language. That would be kids who quote like ABCs or count or those kinds of things. They, but it's not really directed to anybody. They just kind of walk around. Or maybe you ask them. Maybe you say, say the ABCs for me and they spout it out. But again, uh, there's just a marked difference in what they can say with their echolalia or with their rote language versus just a more typical communication. They don't really ask you for things. They might not use, like if they're counting one, two, three, four, five, you can't really say to them how many blocks are here. And, And again, rote memorization is a part of language learning. 
all our kids do it, especially in kindergarten in those early primary grades, but there's just a difference in those kinds of kids who are using that rote memorization. Uh, again, there's, they're also using language in a more typical way. So that's, that's what I want you to hold on to is that there's that real difference. There's, kids may be saying the ABCs, but they're not asking for milk or they're not saying bye-bye or, you know, there's just a real difference there. And then anything that's a self-directed vocalization, like a kid who might hum all the time and you think, gosh, they're, they're so into music. They love music so much. And that may be true, but really their humming is a self-stimulatory vocalization. And remember when you're explaining self-stimulatory to parents, you need to say, that's not really directed to you. That's directed to them. That makes them feel good. It could be mm, the humming feels good on their lips. So that's a pleasant physical experience for them. It could be that they like hearing it. Who knows? We don't know. We don't know why a kid likes whatever they do that's a part of this repetitive speech movement or object use. It somehow pleases them. And so again, that's why we call it self-stimulatory. Uh, perseverations are another kind of repetitive speech. That's where a kid just gets stuck on the same thing and he says it over and over and over. He might say, to infinity and beyond, a hundred times a day. <laughs> without a Buzz Lightyear toy, without the Toy Story movie being on, without, as, he doesn't really want to watch Toy Story. He just is kind of stuck on to infinity and beyond. However, he says it, he says it, you know, over and over and over all day long. Or other kinds of atypical speech things. Now let's move on to the repetitive movement part. This would be that any kind of movement that a child would do with his body repetitively, that stands out that looks a little different. So it could be hand flapping, which is very, very common with uh, toddlers with autism. It could be toe walking. It could be uh, rocking or rocking, however a child decides to do it, or any kind of unusual posture. If you have seen my uh, course on DVD called, Is It Autism? There's a little girl in that uh, clips from therapy, a little girl named Anna Marie that would, every time she got excited, if, if not when she's seated up, but when she's sitting on the floor, every time she got excited, she would lean back and kind of kick both of her feet out. And I would, you know, her mom and I kind of called that her cheerleader pose. <laughs> but that's the kind of thing, it's an abnormal posture. So any movement that makes you kind of look and go, what was that? Or especially if you see them a few times. And sometimes parents don't know that these are different. Uh, they think that it's just, it's become endearing to them because this is their baby who they love with all their hearts. And so I've had parents say things like when a, when a kid is, you know, clenches his fist and is shaking, they'll say, oh, he's acting so crazy today. And they don't really see that that's a self-stimulatory behavior. And those are sometimes, again, really difficult conversations for us to have because parents love that about their kids. They, they associate that behavior with their child and they think that that's just something that their child is doing and guys it is it is self-stimulatory and it is probably related to autism uh, but you don't want to break a parent's heart when you're giving these examples either you want to be as kind and compassionate as you can and uh, still again keeping in mind that parents may hear this for the first time from you but they're going to hear it from everybody else for a long long time with a child so you don't have to get in there and every little thing a kid does you don't have to attribute that to autism even though you can talk about it and certainly should point it out but again i am not one for beating parents up and having them just feel hurt or negative about their own child with things that they can't even control so just wanted to put that in there one other things about one other kind of repetitive um interest or, or behavior here would be repetitive object use. And this really falls under the category of non-purposeful object use like lining up toys rather than playing with them. So if they have a set of cars here, the child would line up the cars instead of rolling the cars all around the table or instead of putting the cars on the floor, he's more interested in lining them up. I've had parents say to me, oh, he's gonna be so OCD, he's gonna be so organized like me, you know, and that mom also has her kitchen cabinets are beautiful and her refrigerator, you know, everything is completely lined up and organized, but this is different because the child can't play. And so instead of, 
like I, that example that I gave with the cars, or let's, let's use a new example. Let's do something like farm animals. So instead of playing with the farm animals, instead of making a cow walk over, take a drink from the pretend trough, go walk to the barn, climb up on the barn, jump off the barn, make the cow go in the gate, close the gate, make the cow sleep. Instead of doing all that, all the kid really wants to do is line up the cows put him right beside and if you mess it up he is going to be really really mad <laughs> we'll talk about that in a minute but that's certainly part of this is non-purposeful object use things like spinning so when a child takes something that you you know a spinner when you see it everything a child gets he wants to spin and so i had one time i had a mom who said to me and this was gosh probably 20 years ago said to me, please don't bring anything in on this home visit way back when everybody took toys. Please don't bring anything in that he can spin. And I just thought, well, I might as well just leave everything in the car because that's not the point. He spins everything. And so again, this is the non-purposeful object use. And so that's what you'll have to do to to talk to parents about it and for this kind of thing you're going to say you know he gets a lot of feedback internally from spinning that toy our job is not to get him to stop spinning our job is to teach him how to play with it and so think about that with non-purposeful object use what are things like that other things like opening and closing doors when a kid is just kind of stuck on that or fidgeting with objects you might have a kid who has to hold something all the time that is really really um a non-purposeful object to use. All right, the next one, insistence on sameness and inflexible expectations. So these are kids who just once they've done something, especially their favorite things, they have to do it in the same way every single time. And so they really, really strictly adhere to their routines. They may, uh, and, and this, this, you can see evidence of this through their whole little lives. They may only eat white foods <laughs> so you may only be able to give them vanilla yogurt mashed potatoes and bread white bread i don't know come up with your own three things but but that's what i mean is they're sticking to what they do if you don't with a lot of these kids if you don't like if you have a little routine a little song you sing when you put them in the car seat if you don't sing that song they are going to lose it and so um, this insistence on sameness and that inflexibility this can really really impact a, a child's daily life and I think that that's something that I didn't say earlier that I meant to say all of these things aren't just something that happened once in a blue moon or you know he did it twice when he was 15 months old and he hasn't done it since these are things that significantly interfere with a child's day. These are things that, that you know, even casual observers would notice and go, gosh, wow, I haven't seen a kid do that before. And so that's a, a, that, that's a real difference too because we know that sometimes – like we just talked about with repetitive speech or object use, a two-year-old might see a movie and get stuck on a little tagline, but it goes away in a few weeks because they've moved on to something else. But these are things that are going to be persistent and, again, things that you can't really get a child uh, to move on with or from without a lot of difficulty. So that strict adherence to routines. The next one is really similar. The next bullet point, ritualized patterns of verbal and nonverbal behaviors. Again, they want that same, uh, they want to hear you say those same things over and over. A big one here is difficulty with transitions. So they show distress at change. So these would be kids, if mom usually takes a child to preschool, if dad's going to do it that day, uh, you better prepare everybody because it's going to be real different. It's going to be real, real hard for that child. It's going to be a challenge. Mom usually does it. He expects mom to do it. Bedtime is another thing or brushing teeth would be another thing. Somebody else tries to do it and they are really, really thrown by that. Or let's say that they expected to have a play date with another child or maybe not. That's a bad example. They expected to go somewhere and then you can't go for whatever reason. It may take a long time to help that child calm down because they don't understand uh, that that's not going to be able to happen due to whatever it might be you had planned to go to the park but it's raining and so you can't go and so a lot of times just that distress at change or something that they didn't expect to happen huge huge deal with kids with autism and here's another marker um, 
that they just really, really uh, have difficulty with things that are new. And so again, we talked about community things like birthday parties and um, going to a family event at someone new's house is just really, really hard for them. And so a lot of times parents don't even really realize this. They just know that they stick to their routines and they don't really do a lot new because that's going to make their child fussy or he's going to miss his nap and then oh we can't miss his nap and so we, again these would be things that parents are doing that they may be compensating for and they don't even know it so you're gonna have to kind of help them see all these things another bullet point here with insistence on sameness and inflexible expectations this is a big one a child doesn't play with a variety of toys and so a lot of kids with autism will and this leads into our next bullet point have intense fascinations and obsessions and this means they really get stuck they like what they like and it is hard to bring in other things new it's hard to get them to want to play with things that uh, they're not really interested in so this would include unusual exploration unusual attachments or sticky attention and again this would mean that I uh, like a kid who's fixated on dinosaurs and he's playing with his favorite dinosaurs but you need him to put the dinosaurs down and come to dinner or to put the dinosaurs down because you're going to take a family picture or to put the dinosaur whatever you need to do he cannot put the dinosaurs down I mean he really loses it it is not just a little two-year-old normal fit that you can take it away give him a sucker move on you're okay this is a child who who falls apart and might cry for 45 minutes because you took his uh, dinosaur away. And again, a lot of times these are unusual attachments. And so you can kind of make that case for a plastic animal that a kid would like. But I've had kids who were really, really fascinated by things like vacuum cleaners. And they, they want to sleep with the vacuum cleaner or they're really, really attached to, say, a feather, and they want to have that feather and hold that feather and put their feather in, you know, in their in their clothes and keep it close to them all the time, and it's really, really hard to get it away from them. So, again, that intense fascination or uh, obsession with that. You might also see hoarding or clutching a favorite item and resist removal like we just talked about. A lot of times kids like this will, if you have that, let's say you have a set of dishes out that everybody wants to play pretend kitchen, this is the kind of kid uh, kids with autism may want all the dishes and so they get really really mad if another child wants a dish or if you want another dish or if mom wants another dish to play with right there and so kind of that hoarding persistent focus on parts of an object rather than the whole object so this is a kid who loves his Thomas the train but really he loves the wheels he is down on his belly spinning those wheels you cannot it is hard to get him to do anything else because he is focused on the wheels of that train so that would be an example of that um, also in this uh, category would be kids who have a preoccupation with visual information. So this would be kids who were stuck on shapes, colors, letters, and numbers. So this might be a kid who mom says, oh my goodness, he has four words. What are they? Blue, red, yellow, and orange. You know, or he might, she'll, you'll say, how many words does he have? And she'll say, he can count to 10. And I'll say, okay, great. What, what other words do we have? That's it. He has 10 words. They're all, you know, he, that's the rote language that we talked about. But he's also really interested in that so that when you're trying to read him a book, He's not looking at the pages or really listen to the story. He wants to flip and look at the, pa the page number and then flip and look at the next page number and flip and look at the next page number. Or a kid who, um, when he's doing a puzzle and you say something like, um, gosh, I, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to make this example work, but let's say you'll say you're holding up a car or a spoon as a speech pathologist. You're trying to test the kid and you say, what's this? And it's a red spoon. And he says red <laughs> because he's focused on the colors. He's fascinated with that. So that would be something there. And also with this category would be kids who have atypical fears. So kids who might, have you had this happen? A kid who just, if you have an office, who cannot get over the threshold of your office because he is terrified of walking in the door that's an atypical fear he's been there 25 times yet his parents still drag him over the threshold or a kid who might be I had uh, feathers in my sensory box my big sensory um, table last year and I was about to take the top off uh, it's right before Thanksgiving and we had feathers and a mom was like don't don't do it you know as I start saying I've got feathers it's so much fun I can't wait to show you I want to show you my turkeys and their feathers and the mom's like no 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 no, no. 
please don't do that. And she's, you know, slamming the table shut. She said, he's going to flip out. He is so scared of feathers. So anything like that where it's really, really atypical, uh, you want to really talk about that and think about that as a part of autism. The last category here is sensory issues. Now, if you are a speech language pathologist like me, and if you've spent your career in pediatrics and early intervention, you might be surprised to hear that not every kid with autism has sensory issues. Um, I haven't met a kid who had or sus autism or suspected autism that didn't have sensory issues, so that's just my input here. But unexpected and unusual reactions to sounds, textures, or other sensory input. This would be kids who freak out with a fire engine when they hear the siren. Kids who um, mom has to come get a child from preschool or from elementary school because the fire alarm went off and he has not been able to recover. Or textures, a kid who gags every time he gets something in his mouth that's a texture that's unpleasant to him. He's not gagging because he can't handle the solid, can't chew it. He's gagging because it's adversive to him. He, he just, it's he can't do it. He, he, that, that texture is revolting to him. And so that certainly is an unexpected, unexpected or unusual reaction. Um, and usually in this, it's going to be a kid has huge overreactions to things or underreactions. And a lot of times we as therapists can miss this. And we talked about this earlier when a kid is really flat. So if we have a kid that, again, we have to spend 45 minutes just trying to get him revved up enough to participate with us. He just wants to shut down and avoid and be alone and not have you in his face. And, and unless he's real, he's content to sit there and play by himself and do his own thing, but when it, he just underreacts to everything. And so that certainly can be just as problematic or troubling as a child who overreacts to everything, a child who is so sensitive. And these are the kids that, again, they might sort of be easier for uh, parents to parent because they've been so easygoing, but it's that underreaction. It should be a little easier to get them involved in what's going on. Okay, and the last one here with sensory issues is difficulty regulating emotional responses. So that means um, it can be just take these kids a really long time to calm down. So that's why with these kinds of kids in therapy, I do everything I can to avoid a meltdown because I don't want the rest of this session to be ruined. And some therapists like our sometimes they're friends in ABA or I, I don't want to slam them because I, I have come to love ABA more and more now that I realize how much of my stuff is really ABA based but they may let these they may let a child be in distress or be upset for much you know a lot of the session thinking that they're really going to learn that way and they're only going to reinforce the positive behavior and that would probably be a really inexperienced ABA clinician because we know that we don't want to reinforce that. We want to reinforce those appropriate social reactions. And so I just try to avoid <laughs> things that I know are going to cause a big meltdown. And I feel like the child, when they get to be more mature, we can handle those kinds of things or start to think about those things. But until then, I'm not going to do anything like that because I don't want to have that difficulty. I don't want to, the rest of the 45 minutes that we have left to be spent with him trying to calm down and me trying to to facilitate that with the child and with mom. So uh, difficulty regulating emotional responses. Kids who throw those fits that, uh, again, I'm using really layman terminology here, but but it's, it's what it is when they have those just significant emotional meltdowns. That's a real sign for autism too. So really, really look at that. All right, I know we're out of time, but I do want to mention on the handout, there are three severity uh, ratings and you can look at what um, those are. I think about them as mild, moderate, and severe, but I, that's probably not uh, the most professional uh, interpretation of that. That's just a really common thing that we do when we're talking with parents. But level one is they require support without their supports in place there are noticeable impairments when these kids have restricted um, RRBs or restricted <clears throat> excuse me repetitive behaviors they cause significant issues in one or more contexts this isn't just something that happens every once in a while and then a child resists attempts for redirection that's the most mild and so when we have sometimes a parent again doesn't really they're not really ready a lot of times to really look at um, that a child be, may be more moderately to severely affected. And so I, I just wanted to point out that mild one because that kind of surprises parents. They think that sounds, they, they, they think they, 
That's the mildest level. Let's just put it like that. All right, the second level, again, requiring substantial support. Even when we have a plan in place and strategies in place, a child still has a hard time. He's still, his uh, restricted and repetitive behaviors or his preoccupations or his little hot buttons, they, that's what he wants to do most of the time. And they, those kinds of things appear frequently enough that a casual observer would say, gosh, wow, you know, and really notice that kind of behavior. They would notice the hand flapping or notice the toe walking or notice that a child flips out because mom uh, tried to take the iPad away at a restaurant. So again, a moderate rating. And then level three is requiring very substantial report, uh, support. And these are the kids that have minimal response to social overtures, meaning you have just, you might work and work and work and work and work to keep their attention, but gosh, it is so hard. They're still going to be involved with their own preoccupations or fixations. And so again, that it markedly interferes with their functioning in all areas. And there are, at this level three, a child shows marked distress when rituals or routines are interrupted. And you know those kids, and parents know those kids too. It's just sometimes hard to hear this. So I hope that this information will give you a better way of not only understanding autism yourself, but being able to articulate that and explain that to parents and help them understand it as well. Now, if you need ideas for designing a comprehensive treatment plan for a toddler or a preschooler with signs of autism, I can help you. That is uh, the whole purpose of my new treatment manual called the Autism Workbook, Developing Speech Therapy Plans for Toddlers and Preschoolers with Red Flags for ASD. So if you're a therapist, you're going to want this in your personal library because it's going to help you when you get ready to write goals and again this information uh, how to explain autism to parents is certainly included uh, in this project as well so I hope that you'll check that out all right that's it for today there are 12 more shows in this series so get ready I hope that you'll learn as much as I have um, in studying this material thanks so much I'm Laura Mize pediatric speech language pathologist and you have just watched the very first show in our autism podcast series from teachmetotalk.com.